12 years since the last Lebanon war, Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah is still in his bunker. Will deterrence hold? And if it crumbles, will the next war in the north involve direct combat, not only with Iranian proxies, but with Tehran's vaunted Quds Force? Here's my interview with former Israeli Defense Minister and IDF Chief of Staff Moshe Yalon. Let's take a look. Moshe Yalon, thank you so much for taking time to address uh, the uh, American and international viewers of Strictly Security. Thank you for having me, Barbara. It's a pleasure. Uh, let's start with the Northern Front. This week marks 12 years since the start of the Second Lebanon War, a war that was highly criticized by the Commission of Inquiry here um, for numerous failings on the part of the IDF and the government at the time. Yet here we are, 12 years on, relative quiet on the northern border. Uh, is this a result of Israeli uh, strong Israeli deterrence, or perhaps that Hezbollah has been busy fighting on behalf of the Assad regime in Syria? Yes, uh, the Second Lebanon War was criticized justifiably at that time. Nevertheless, uh, no doubt that the parties in the northern arena are deterred from the IDF, from the Israel Defense Forces. That's why Hezbollah, in the last couple of years, refrained from provoking any escalation in the north. I understand that they are going to pay heavy price for any escalation. And that's why we enjoy a, a calm situation along the border with, with Lebanon. Mm -hmm. But we have to emphasize that actually Lebanon has been abducted by the Iranian regime. A decision to wage a war against Israel is not going to be made in Beirut, neither by the Lebanese government nor by Hassan Nasrallah. This kind of decision is going to be made in Tehran by Khamenei, the Iranian regime. Now, that commission of inquiry obviously affixed much of the blame on Danny Khalutz, the former Air Force commander who succeeded you as IDF chief of staff. Yet you were also targeted for much of the blame in the run-up to the Lebanon war, for neglecting the needs of the active duty and reserve ground forces, for minimizing the importance, perhaps, of maneuvering ground war, and for your support of uh, intellectual concepts such as effects-based operations and um, influencing the psychological um, consciousness of the enemy rather than standard military directives to encircle, to flank, and to strive for decisive warfare. In this day and age when you're fighting, when Israel is fighting a non-state, such a well-armed non-state actor, are concepts such as decisive victory even possible and relevant? No doubt that in certain cases we need the uh, ground operation, the ground maneuver. But we enjoy today not just the IDF, uh, Western Armed Forces, with certain capabilities which didn't have in the past, like intelligence dominance in a way that in many cases the enemy is transparent to us. Uh, the command control communication system in which we are able to deliver any piece of information in real time to any operational level, whether it is ground forces, the Navy, and most of it to the Air Force to launch airstrikes, but with precise munition. So accurate that if you hit, it, it's a matter of centimeters of accuracy. So when we talked in the past in delivering the war to the enemy's uh, side, we can do it by fire. But we shouldn't ignore the fact that in certain cases we should use and deploy ground forces. It was not managed so well in the Second Lebanon War. It is not because of what justifiably we decided to put more on intelligence superiority, on command control, communication, computer, cyber information systems, and of course, precise munition. But today, is it indeed possible to achieve a decisive victory? What does it mean, decisive victory, in such wars, in which you have terror organizations, militias, uh, using their own civilians as human shield, targeting your own civilians, using rockets, missiles? Mm -hmm. What did you do in protective edge operation, as an example? When you were defense minister. When I was the defense minister. 
we charged them with so heavy price that at the end they came and they begged for ceasefire without getting anything. So for me, a victory in this kind of operation is not going to Beirut and uh, waving with the Israeli flag. It's charging the other side with so heavy price that at the end they will not get anything and we'll reach a ceasefire according to our conditions and getting a couple of years and peace and tranquility, not because they support us, because they are deterred from us. Now in Syria, Prime Minister Netanyahu has been quite assertive in this, uh, what has become almost routine preemptive military strikes in Syria to prevent high level weaponry from reaching the hands of Hezbollah. And that's in stark contrast to what uh, you advised uh, back in the days before the Lebanon, uh, second Lebanon war, where you were opposed to a preventive uh, action that could spark a war. And your advice was to let those missiles and rockets in the Hezbollah arsenal rust. Uh, we went to preemptive strikes during my time as defense minister, not to allow our enemies to, to, to rearm, like uh, intercepting shipments of weapons to Hezbollah, uh, intercepting uh, shipments, Iranian shipments of weapons to, to Hamas, whether it was by sea or whatever. That's a preemption. But I didn't say regarding Hezbollah at that time that we should allow them to be rusted, the missiles, to cause them to be rusted, and very different. And it was a, a, a policy, a strategy run by Prime Minister Sharon at that time, a combination of diplomatic pressure on Hezbollah to be considered as a terror organization, and they were afraid of it. Then to generate the internal discourse in Lebanon, whom Hezbollah is serving, which goals, which interests. For us, for Lebanese, no. For the Iranians, why should we pay the price? And, and then, of course, not to allow them to, uh, to bring us to attrition-type warfare that they tried and did in the past. Rockets uh, uh, launching towards uh, Shaba farms and, and elsewhere. We didn't allow it. So we uh, uh, responded aggressively to this kind of provocation. But we thought that by using these three elements in our strategy, we have to cause the, the missiles and the rockets to be rusted and not to allow them to be rusted. Now, you were not alone in your thinking that this broken egg, this omelet that was once Syria, could ever be put back together again. But here we are, uh, and the Assad regime forces are about to overtake or reclaim areas right beyond Israel's border. Is Prime Minister Netanyahu correct in insisting that any Iranian military presence in Syria will not be tolerated? And are you concerned that he might be relying too much on Vladimir Putin to deliver the goods? Uh, I do support the idea of not to allow Iranian threatening presence in Syria. And actually, the Iranian tried to open a terror front against us when I was a defense minister in 2015. At that time, they used proxies to perpetrate terror attacks against us. And we absorbed about 12 terror attacks in a couple of months. The last time was August 2015, in which the last proxy uh, passed away. Let's put it this way. The three of them, Jihad Morania, Samir Kuntar, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and that was the end of it. Last February, they renewed the hostilities. In this case, uh, deploying unmanned air vehicle by the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps and Quds Force officers. This unmanned air vehicle was uh, immediately intercepted. Do you see the UAE taking a lead in normalizing and becoming more open with uh, strategic cooperation with the Jewish state? I call for our uh, Sunni Arab neighbors. Let's not be hostages to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. For the Sunni Arab regimes, Iran is the main enemy. It's Shia versus Sunnis. The a Sunni coalition fights the Houthis, and Iranian, likewise Hezbollah, proxy 
in, uh, in Yemen. Now the leader of the Sunni Arab camp is, is Saudi Arabia. Uh, listening to the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman and his statements recently in, in, in uh, the United States, acknowledging our right to have a Jewish state. That's what he said. Wow, it's very new. We can do a lot to, to keep the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as, 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 as an obstacle for making progress. It's like being hostages to the Palestinians in this case. Moshe Yalon, such a pleasure. Thank you, Baba. Look forward to having you back. Thank you.